Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Nick Bias. I am the faculty within the data science and operations, as well as founding executive director for Global Supply Chain Management Institute, known as Kendrick Global Supply Chain Management uh, Institute at University of Southern California, USC. I'm extremely privileged to have these conversations with my panelists here, and we'll go around the room quickly to get the brief introduction. So, Dave, why don't we start with you? Thanks so much. Nice to meet everybody here. I'm Dave Evans, uh, founder and CEO of a company called Fictive. Uh, we help companies simplify all their sourcing for custom manufactured parts. Um, we operate in four different countries, US, Mexico, India, and China. Uh, we've been in business for 10 years, raised $200 million, and we built all this AI and technology to really build a lot of workflow software for, for simplifying sourcing. So really excited to talk about AI, technology, and thanks for having me, Nick. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Greg? Yeah, hi, Greg Javert with uh, Mattel, uh, the toy company that's had some good success with Barbie. Uh, I head up the... Uh, global logistics and logistics procurement function, uh, and have been at Mattel for seven years, and been in supply chain my entire career. Thank you, Greg. Maya? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Maya Benson, uh, SaaS product and platform exec for a big corporate for many years, and then found myself with a rocket ship company many of you might know called Shopify, not Spotify. Uh, and I built all shipping and fulfillment for them as well as the shop app. Any consumers in here using the shop app? Just a quick raise of hands. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I switched to the other side of the table. I'm now an early stage uh, B2B SaaS investor, uh, generalist approach, but probably about 60 to 70% of my portfolio is in next gen e -com and logistics for obvious reasons. And just want to give a shout out. We've got at least six of our founders in this room today. Cool. Excellent. Excellent. My By the way, Hot Wheels. Ooh. Best thing when I was a kid. Loved Hot Wheels. Uh, my name is Mark Hansen. I'm with Sony. I'm actually with Sony Semiconductor. Most of you are going to look at it and go, why is a semiconductor guy here at the logistics and uh, manufacturing show? Uh, I work with a new group in Sony called Itrios. And Itrios is a platform for taking everything you can't see in your supply chain and turning it into data that you can use. And I'll explain more about it a little bit later, but really happy to be on this panel. Thank you so much, Mark. So, so what are we talking about today in this panel? Of course, we're gonna talk about the data synthesizations, the AI, the visual, uh, the computer vision, but talk about the supply chain as a whole. So let's start with supply chain. And there was a world of supply chain before COVID, and there was a world of supply chain after COVID. So, Dave, why don't we start with you? Give us the sort of a pulse check on what has happened since COVID disruption. Well, we can do audience participation here, right? Yeah. Uh, how many people are in supply chain in the room? Okay, good. How many people feel like your life is easier today than it was four years ago? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so we're definitely in a moment that it's a when moment, not an if. When is the next thing gonna happen? When are we gonna see the next disruption? What's the challenge we're gonna have? You know, as we talk with all of our customers, our founding teams, executive teams, uh, budgets have never been more tight. The expectation of delivery and margin expansion has never been higher. And so supply chain leaders are left with, I need to do more with less, and then we have all this global risk on here. So I think what, um, the last three years, and maybe go back like five, has really shown us in supply chain is that all the things that were possibly could go wrong have kind of shown their face. And I think that's created an immense challenge for all the leaders in the room. So I hope we can share at least some tips and tricks for how to improve that. Um, but I have a lot of empathy for all of you. So Greg, let's talk about the empathy. Uh, you and Mark, you and the Mark, you're on the semiconductor side from the retail standpoint. This was beyond the empathy. It was a brutal torture during the COVID disruptions, right? I mean, anything that could go wrong did go wrong. The structural deficiencies of four decades were exposed. How did you feel being at Mattel, running the show, 
having this massive disruption? Yeah, I think, first of all, at Mattel, we were fortunate that our business grew like 29% during the pandemic, right? So, so you benefited there some from other, there was Yeah, we benefited from it, but uh, that, that's a, a tribute to the advanced teamwork uh, in supply chain. Uh, we also came out with a lot of gaps, right? I could talk about you know, gaps in our, I call the circulatory system of uh, logistics on our inbound logistics. There were many gaps on information uh, flows, inventory that were our all ahas, you know, during the pandemic that we're, 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 we're now fixing. A lot of them, you know, we fixed uh, with some easy wins, but, you know, we're going to have fantastic end -end, end to end visibility because you need that and you need to predict uh, when your inventory is going to be, be available for sale. So, so, Greg, let's go back to the manufacturing. Have we seen fundamental shift of what the decisions were in how, where to manufacture to today where you're thinking about manufacturing? Yeah, I mean, manufacturing, first of all, during the pandemic, what, what I would say is there's, you know, our goods are primarily manufactured in Asia. Uh, we saw uh, with our relationships we built uh, with our carriers and shippers on what we call the trade side of our business. We saw good movement, obviously higher cost, there was inflation, but on our direct import side where our customers take title uh, in, you know, in China, that, that, that backed up, right? So you could see the difference and, you know, it nearly shut down manufacturing from a space standpoint. We had to do a lot of crazy things with getting storage yards uh, in the NTN, for example, paying a half a million dollars for a 400 container storage yard, so a, a lot of high cost. As we've come out of, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, that's, that's all behind us, and it's, it's really about positioning, you know, manufacturing to maintain our competitive advantages that we have, for example, in Hot Wheels and die cast and in dolls, right? So there's a lot of strategy going on uh, at the board level on decisions on where we want to produce and uh, given the geopolitical situation. So it's a lot more strategic. Uh, and, you know, again, nearshoring comes into that because we do have a plant in uh, Mexico on how we load that uh, to ship goods, uh, make goods and ship them to our customers, which the U.S. is our l largest market where we can get uh, uh, goods in uh, from an, you know, order to make to deliver to the customer in, in 48 hours in the U.S. Okay. So, Mark, uh you know, he talks about the, uh, what I call the decouplings of supply chain. So let me actually get into that conversation. I was the first one in 2014 that I wrote the white paper about the decouplings of supply chain. This is before the COVID. And I had no foresight that COVID was going to happen. Right? And I remember about eight or nine emails that came that thought the people thought that I was smoking something. Mm -hmm. How real do you think this decoupling or the reshoring, nearshoring, right shoring concepts from a Sony perspective that you think that we have to really deal with it? So, at least in the case of uh, like Japan, as an example, um, they're having actual labor issues, not necessarily because of COVID, but because the population is aging. So they're often having to try to figure out how to do things in a way that will um, be much more efficient to enable the workers that they do have access to can do more, essentially. So one of the things that we did at Sony Semiconductor was started thinking through how can we kind of democratize the ability of people to use um, vision AI capabilities to put eyes on the things where they really do struggle to have a difficulty in understanding what they should do. The examples that I always give are like a retailer, they know the inventory in the back, they know what sales are happening. But in between those two things, they often don't know anything. So our challenge was to try to figure out how do we, how do we enable some new capabilities so they can actually see physically what's happening, but do it in a way that's practical, that's quick, that's low cost, uh, that doesn't tax their network systems. We were talking about network optimization a little bit that doesn't tax their networks, that preserves pri privacy. And the way we did it was kind of interesting. We, 
where our claim to fame is making image sensors, mostly for 60% of the cell phones that are in this, this audience today. But ha, we actually make a image sensor that has an AI processor on the back of it and enables us to do interesting things like make little teeny cameras like this. And with the iTrios platform, we can actually do this at scale. How many people here have actually tried to do vision AI as part of their logistics or manufacturing or retail operation? Can I see your hands? So it's not a lot, but what we want to do is make it much easier for you to start to gather that data that's kind of in your blind spot. And for those folks that are considering uh, onshoring or reshoring, uh, like the United States as an example, our baby boomers are aging out as well. So we're going to encounter similar things. So I think bringing manufacturing back to the United States or somewhere close to it has similar issues in that we're going to have to try to figure out how to m understand what's happening and make better choices on our logistics and manufacturing capabilities that we're doing. We hope to help with that. Thank you, Mark. And by the way, the audience, I do want to hear your questions. So there should be a barcode and you can actually submit your questions and I will be able to uh, pull in those questions as well. Uh, I hope there is a barcode that you can scan to it. Okay, uh, so Maya, let's follow the money. All of those disruptions we talked about, have that shifted your focus on where to invest and how much to invest before COVID and up, after COVID? So absolutely, uh, venture capital deployed in 2019 was the same as it was last year. There were two years in between that we all lived through where double the amount has been deployed, right? So there's a lot of technology that's about two to three years old right now, y'all, that you're gonna start seeing in your backyards if you're not already. So for example, the computer vision powered by these amazing cameras by Sony, those are gonna be everywhere shortly, right? Because there's just tons of advancements in how to capture uh, physical stuff digitally. So, um, so yes, we very much have seen uh, a lot of what you guys are living and invested deeply in companies that can help uh, uh, brands and retailers and many uh, brands and retailers uh, be resilient, right? So diversify where they get their sourcing make sure they've got algorithms that when the networks to bring stuff from the manufacturer on shore um, work, right? And can be easily uh, pivoted if, if something's arisen, arisen in the network. So uh, very, very sensitive to the physical to digital uh, opportunities that computer vision can, um, can uh, manifest as well as all of the infrastructure layers and data layers needed to build resiliency from sourcing all the way through landing on, on somebody's back dock. Thank you. And I'm seeing the questions coming in, so we will try to plug those in as appropriately. But so let's talk about, just for the audience, to give some pretense to my role uh, being in academia. So these conversations about the AI and the com computer vision and advanced computing, it's no longer just an industry phenomenon, right? My institute got endowed about two years ago with one of a very generous board member who gifted $20 million. It was purely the passion for all the innovation and advancements in supply chain, right? That money could have very well gone into the medical research or engineering side in the past, that came to the supply chain. So I wanted to set the foundation for that. On top of it, at USC, uh, our president, President Fault, just announced we're creating a brand new school funded with a billion dollar, with a capital B, to start advanced computing school. This is where the application of AI, ML, and other advanced technology will cross the barriers of the traditional schools. So I'm from the business school, there is a medical school, there is a film school, there is a music school, there is a policy school, but how does the AI and all of this technology cut across the landscapes at the university? Now when the research university, such as USC, takes a big investment approach into this, this is no longer 
a problem that is being solved by industry or the regulatory processes, but I wanted to highlight that academia is actually putting the money behind the mount. So with that, let's start the conversation. Dave, you have a phenomenal startup. I would not call it a startup. I think it's a decade-old concept that you've proven very well. Take us through the manufacturing, right? What is that new lens of technology evolution fits into your world? Yeah, I mean, the, the lens that all approach this, if you have the academia, you have folks that have been doing this in large corporations, I'm your technologist. Silicon Valley, venture-backed, how do you apply real technology to solve you know, discrete workflow uh, and, and issues across supply chain? Our lens, if you rewind back to 2013, this was like Uber, Lyft, TaskRabbit, Airbnb, uh, WhatsApp, you know, these are the companies that are coming. No one was thinking about advancements in manufacturing or supply chain. It's a very different world, which you, you know, you heard in today's landscape for what venture capital looks like and technology specifically. Our, my approach as a technologist, uh, you know, leading this company is that it's all about how do you apply the best type of automation in your company? And when we define automation, we think about human plus machine. And I think that's a really important thing to call out the difference here. Everyone wants to talk about AI, AI, AI. It's not gonna replace the human in the loop. Supply chains are still too complex. Manufacturing is too complex. So how do you build workflows where if it took 10 hours for an individual to do that in manufacturing, with AI, with automation, how can you do it in one hour? That's what we need to start tackling. Not lights out automation. I think too much of that becomes vaporware, too much hype. It's maybe good for academic papers, but in my world, as a pragmatist, as a technologist, I wanna make sure we're adding value today. And so what we've built over the 10 years is really this global supply chain. It's a Fortune 500 ready to go that people can plug into so that they don't have to set up teams in China, teams in Mexico to run all this. Because not all of us have the resources of Mattel or Sony you know, to actually do this work. Um, but I think that when you talk about technology, I always want to talk about human in the loop. And I think that's really important as we answer some of these questions on AI today, is that we're talking about what are the real problems we're solving, what's the productivity gains, margin expansion, all of these, these things, Nick. So, so, so Dave, basically what you're saying is an augmented AI where human is still a critical link in terms of embracing the technology. 100%, just today we launched materials.ai. It's all to help engineers, procurement managers, supply chains choose better uh, materials that are available today. The job is not to replace application engineers or specialists, it's to give them this resource that you'd have to read a 90 page data sheet to get the same information. So I think that's a tangible example where you're not removing humans from it, you're giving all this leverage, you're giving all this productivity gains that happens. And you know, as we go through the panelists and we talk you know, about what Greg and Mark are building, I think it's a very similar story across the board. Right, so I think uh, one of the questions uh, the audience has, uh, uh, do you see mathematical optimization and prescriptive analytics as a major part of the efficiency gains for the companies. So let me answer that from the academic standpoint. I, I heard just being here, the regenerative AI, the, uh, the term AI, I have probably heard about 100 times in the last eight hours, right? That has become almost like a dot com in 2000, for those of you who remember, that everything that was there was dot com, right? You had a brilliant idea, you put dot com behind it, it was worth selling it. You had a stupidest idea and you put dot com behind it, it was still worth selling it. I feel like the AI, we're getting into that point. My perspective to that question from the academic standpoint, AI and ML, when you look at the model and algorithms behind it, it is purely the mathematical exercise and optimization. But I don't think as a practitioner, Greg, that you really care about that, you leave those to the data scientist and the programmer, how do you really use that in your business world and maximize opportunity for the optimization, if you do. Yeah, I, th I think we're, 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 we're just at, at the start, so I'll talk about that. But I'll, I, I will never lose sight of you know, the goal, which is, you know, I'll, I'll call it operational excellence, right? Yeah. That's one of the things. And operational excellence is more than just doing things well, right? That's part of it. But 
the rest of it that I keep like preaching to my team is is about you know our role is to unite our organizations around our purpose right around great processes and using great systems that are that are seamless right so that's you, you always want to keep that so what Dave said about you know humans and machines and the interaction is is, is very important some of the and then I'll, I'll talk in, in manufacturing it's there's intense change, right? Whether it's AI, machine learning, your integrated processes. So, but what is the overarching thing with that? It's really all centered around the customer experience, right? At the end, that's the big, big change. So we're, we're, we're using that and using a lot and starting with the customer experience, as I say, with AI. So where does that lead to? Obviously with uh, what you'd call, you know, your, your, uh, your voice recognition things, right? That we're, we're using and we're seeing about a 10% a productivity improvement uh, in, our, in, in, in our customer operations with that. We're starting to use, uh, you know, that, that voice sensing, I'm not sure what it is, that, that if, 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 you see, if the AI is seeing a different response from the, from the customer, will prompt different questions to ask, right? So, so we're, we're learning on that. Uh, product development, you know, we're using Microsoft Copilot, right? And, you know, we're doing things around sounds uh, for our toys and games, uh, using that around the creative studio uh, and then around uh, our documents, right? In the quality side, we're, we're, we're using, I think it's, it's Google, it's Bard, right? And, you know, we're, we're using that around our, you know, our speech recognition, right? Uh, smart vision systems that we talked about. Uh, and again, the customer operations. So that's what we've started with. We also have, you know, there, there's so much interest across all the regions that we've set up, a, uh, you know, an AI governance board you know, as part of IIT group to make sure we, we keep control and gain, you know, efficiencies and leverage across across the regions, right? Not a bureaucratic thing, I think it's a good thing. Very good, so, so Mark, you talked about the one application, in-store inventory management, the planogram versus actual inventory. When you think about that, what are the biggest pain point for companies that you see that they'll have trouble implementing a computer vision and AI solution into their company? Yeah, the traditional ways of doing vision AI are kind of cumbersome. So uh, even if they have a well-defined uh, problem that they're trying to solve, usually they can solve it with what I would call academic solutions, which typically mean lots of streaming cameras, lots of big edge servers, GPUs, uh, power-hungry implementations. But it works great as a research project, but I think the biggest struggle that most of the customers out there in logistics and retail and manufacturing are how to deploy it at scale because those are just crazy costs and crazy amounts of complexity um, where what we've done is push it all to the backside of an image sensor with the idea that that simplifies everything and enabling a very simple process. Well, our, our strategic partner is Microsoft and and uh, Azure is the platform that we reside on as an enterprise uh, pass solution, and we're we're just the we're just the conduit to which you can take visual data and turn it into actionable data. We got lots of ISV partners, uh, folks like Neuralo who are working on factory inspections, uh, implementing those kind of solutions on top of what our platform can do. But because we can do it at scale, because it doesn't tax your your existing network infrastructure. You don't have to lay out a lot of complex Cat5 streaming cameras. You know, our cameras use about 100 milliwatt on average. A smart camera with a GPU is 100 watts. An edge server is 1,000. So even the environmental impacts, 20 cameras to one edge server, if you need 500 in a factory or a logistics, you're talking thousands of watts 24-7 that are costing you money and also not helping the environment. So that's the kind of things that we're trying to solve by using our semiconductor skill with the 
pixel image and the AI processor on one chip to try to drive that. Th thank you. So Maya, let's get back into the world of investing. AI, I am sure you're probably getting a dozen pitch a day about new concepts coming up to you. How do you bifurcate noise from the signal, where to invest and where not to? So I think it's really important just to like, or we're living in a world right now where it feels like it's just AI. <laughs> so I think at a first principles level, it's important to remind all of us, AI and ML have been around for a long time, right? What's new is this democratization of the transformer models from OpenAI, Lambda, BART, et cetera. So just, I think that's an important comment. We've been in the AML, AI and ML investing business for a long time. Uh, it's generative that's really the amazing new um, technology on the block. Uh, kindly remind me what the specific, I had to get that out, because we're living in a world where, where, remind me where you were, yeah. So question, how do you make a decision? Oh, Which signal, company to invest or yeah, not? Yeah. Signal understanding the noise. signal versus the noise. Yeah, so you guys probably all read or saw in like March of 2022 when uh, OpenAI hit the street, venture capital went crazy, right? And there was a ton of money deployed against um, really amazing founders building in this new generative space, but without a lot of conscious thought to a lot of the incumbents that own our eyeballs and um, software usage every day, building and leveraging this technology. So we kind of held back a little bit from that. And our thesis is really investing in uh, folks harnessing as their core business of generative AI. Another important first principle, if you aren't leveraging Gen AI or have a plan to throughout your supply chain, come talk to me. That's, that's, that's radically gonna change in all of our lives. Um, but back to the point, we believe that Gen AI is really, really powerful in niche and verticalized markets. So we think a lot of the platform companies and cloud companies will solve general use cases. But for example, we invest in a company called Lumi.ai that helps all of you running supply chain every day, not only get data scientists insights fed to you, but actually recommendations that you can act on, right? So we're moving away from, hey, let's surface, let's train the models on supply chain to surface what the insights are. So basically democratizing your data teams, but also now generating recommendations that as a human, you can action on. And we can imagine a world where I'm gonna talk to you guys in about two or three years, and those actions, in many cases, will be rules that are auto-turned on. So, um, so the, the signal for us has really been focused on, we have theses around what the platforms are gonna embed, what the leading software companies that already have our eyeballs are, are gonna embed, what the cloud service providers are gonna embed, and we're really looking at niche verticals where there's, there are unique data sets um, and uh, are kind of in the periphery of, of the mainstream. Appreciate it. So let, let's go into, I think, uh, Mark and Greg, and we talked about <clears throat> academic research is being viewed as sort of not relevant. So I wanted to kind of establish the footings on that. Right, there are two types of research, advanced research and applied research. Right, so the institute like uh, research, purely research institute like USC, Stanford, or IVs, right? We are an incredible talent. My colleagues, they focus on advanced research, right? So the, absolutely, there's a perspective and a perception that it may not be relevant to what we're talking about today. The institute that I run and the research that I do is applied research, meaning we take an industry problem or we take network optimization problem at the country level, for example, so when I was part of the advisory committee with Department of Commerce under White House, we take a big issue and then we help apply the solutions through the research. So the, I wanted to make sure the universities here or anybody from university, they're not thrown under the bus. So there are two different stream of uh, research that both are equally important. So wanted to establish the footings here. So with that being said, all of these great ideas that we talked about, Dave, let's start with you. What is the build versus buy? Do I buy something that's ready to plug in, or do I actually go through and build out my network when we talk about the optimization? 
we were talking about this dinner last night with Greg and I, you know, for anyone that's undergone a large IT or back office transformation, you know, I think this is a big question. Um, the advice I always give is, is it gonna be core competency of your business? And is it gonna differentiate? And so if it's gonna be core competency, you can probably start to make uh, an argument for building it internally. But if it's not gonna be core competency of something that's gonna differentiate your business, gonna generate revenue, gonna be a part of that, it's probably there are other people spending more money, more infrastructure to build a stronger solution. The example I always give in, in our world is, is your supply chain, let's say the partners you work with for your manufacturing, is that gonna differentiate your product? And if you look at all the parts that are on a bill of materials for the product you're building, which of them are actually like differentiators there, a sensor that you buy, you know, a camera system, and which of them actually complete the product? In these cases, a buy versus build, you know, is a great case to say, do I need to own this in its core strategy? Or is it something that it's another company's core strategy? Um, in our world, our core strategy is running a global network of manufacturing partners and all over in four different regions. And I think there are very few supply chains that would invest the amount of time, money, energy to build the technology that we have. Um, and there are other partners like that that have that level of sophistication. Um, I think IT projects, we always said, are 2x the budget, at least 2x the time, uh, and a lot more late nights than that. Is that, is that, is that accurate, you think? Yeah, Greg? So, so expand upon that. Greg, I mean, this is a decade old problem. I, I, you know, I, I would say that you know, we will look at things more off the shelf, but we'll scratch our head. For example, we were, I, I was in Asia last week, we were talking about shop floor scheduling for our plants. These are four and 5,000 people plants. There are off the shelf things, they're just not gonna apply to our industry. So we realize that we're gonna have to build it, right? And, and is, it, is it worth building? Core competency. Yeah, and, and, and the core competency uh, uh, issue. We will look at, you know, moving, you know, gee, it'd be great to, you know, relocate as we're shuffling our manufacturing because we have a asset light model. It's going to be about 50-50, uh, you know, owned and operated versus co-manufacturing, right? There's a sweet spot, you know, for that. Then you look at, as we do that and we transition our network, what about tooling? Right? And you start looking at tooling and you do a lot of analysis to say, now is it going to be worth it to open up a tooling plant uh, you know, a, a, you know, near, near your manufacturing site? And then Not you come core. to the conclusion, no, it's, we're, we're gonna, it'll, it'll just be easier to air freight what we need uh, around and, and, and pay the logistics expense. It's not worth the investment. So there's a lot of deep thought with that. Uh, but I think most of the things you know, that we want to take advantage of is, is off the shelf when we can, right? That's, it's proven. I think what Greg just went through is the near shore conversation every company's having today. That we want to near shore, we want to come to the US, maybe Mexico, maybe Canada, other regions, but this cascading effect of, okay, well, my parts, am I 50-50 on asset light, am I 40-60? And then all the way you start going down to Okay, well, who's gonna actually ship it? Is it on a plane? Is it on, on sea? What carriers am I gonna do? New tooling, old tooling? All of these questions go back into the buy versus build. And I wanna go full circle and say, technology can help solve this problem. And every team's trying to brute force it in spreadsheets, meetings, teams, all these things. And this type of decision-making, building matrix, matrices for you, that is where technology can help you. Um, and there are a lot of companies that focus on that core problem right there. Um, but I think this is a fascinating topic of buy, buy versus build. So yeah, so let's talk about it. I think we, we touched on a quite a few things, right? When I talk about opt-in and write about emerging technologies, AI and ML is a subset of a quite a few things. And I, I have a perspective, I'll come back to what I consider the emerging technology that we're gonna be seeing on the horizon for next decades to come. Let's start with you, uh, Mark. What are the buckets of other technology you think that they're equally valued or should be valued as we're talking about AI? 
Yeah, I, th I think AI is only as good as the data. So <laughs> part of the dilemma, I mean, you can even see versions of chat as an example. The more data it gets, the better it gets. And part of our mantra is, how do we bring in the data that nobody can see? So that, so, you know, m most of the systems that everybody's using today, you know, um, Greg talked about some of them, um, and Dave did too. Uh, to, to us, to build or buy kind of scenario that you were talking about earlier, um, it really depends on like the company's brand and what they're trying to accomplish. Like one company might be concerned about customer service and interaction and want to know what that interaction is. Another one might be concerned about safety related issues. So how to build those kind of solutions, sometimes they don't exist off the shelf and you end up with all of these discrete ones if you do. So how to tie all that information together in a relative way on a standardized platform in a way that can be reused for new problems, that's what we're trying to do as a, as a, as a vision company, is, is try to figure out what we can do to enable that capability so it suits the customer experience and the brand that, that wants to implement those types of solutions. So, so how much of that effort, because I feel like the data acquisition IoT devices and other me, me, means of gathering the data and obviously having the data analytics capability, both the predictive and prescriptive. How does Sony looks at other things other than just AI and the computer vision? Well, we started actually, uh, I, I mean, we're, we're at, at the base level, we're a sensor company. So we're, we're dealing with images for the most part. But, but we're a sensor company, so there are other types of data that we hopefully in the future with our Idrius platform can bring in to add value to those use cases and scenarios. But the, they may be things that we're not physically seeing today, data that's av available but not in the physical world for eyes, our eyes as an example. There may be other data sources that we can ascertain things that can really help the process along. So I think, again, it comes back to data. What's the right blend of data that you need to do the right decisions? So Maya, what excites you in terms of emerging technologies outside of AI? What do you look for other technology phenomena outside of AI? That's a lot of AI these days, y'all. <laughs> so it's a lot, a lot of AI. We are super bullish on computer vision. Uh, when I say there's this AI bucket that's a lot of our time, a lot of it's deeply, deeply rooted in the data uh, point uh, made, made by Mark. Um, those from a software perspective are, are really the, the big, big lanes from a, a next gen of tech that we're, we're focused on. Okay, Greg? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll use the example, and it's pretty simple in our <clears throat> inbound logistics system. We're, we're shipping 50,000 containers. Uh, our availability dates in the markets are very important that we achieve those dates. This was around again, November, October, November. They're really right. important. So, so, <laughs> so, you know, we're a, as we are closing the gaps, we are using, you know, uh, predictive ETAs, right? You know, the subscription company behind that. We understand it, or some of my team understands it. There, there's 41 variables that they're using to, to continue to update the systems. But as everyone says, it's only going to be as good as our, our providers update the information. And but you know, it's also we had to stand up during the pandemic and after the pandemic because the the inbound market changed. We were doing a lot more drayage where the ocean carriers used to do it door to door. Now it's port to port, so we had to pick up the drayage piece. You've got to pick up all that milestone data. Uh, it's in disparate systems, but it's all going to come together, you know, at the end of this year in one system. And and you know, we're we're expecting to be world class with uh, uh, with with that at a at a pretty high reliability that the goods will be there. Yes, so Dave, um, when I'm talking about emerging technologies, obviously besides the data, advanced data analytics, advanced robotics. 3D printing and many other things that we have in the portfolio of things. What do you What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to actually take a different track on this. What I'm most excited about is in the climate tech space and how that's going to transform all of our supply chains. 
I want to imagine a world where my kids live in a better earth than, than I do. And so logistics and, uh, and all the work that goes on in manufacturing is very harmful to our earth. And so looking at the advancements in climate tech, whether it's battery storage and efficiencies we're seeing in that, whether it's a electric propulsion in both air and in, in truck and car, uh, or it's looking at energy capture that we're doing in geothermal, nuclear, or solar, all of these have the chance to completely change the way our businesses run today. As corporate leaders, we talk a lot about ESG as something that's really important, but it's really challenging to flow that through your business. So while AI is, is incredibly exciting, it's a lot of technology, we've talked about all these different advancements, I think uh, the call to arms I take to everyone in the room is how can sustainability and the work that's being done in climate tech affect your business as much, if not more, than what AI is doing. Uh, we've made a lot of, lot of commitments on our side around carbon neutral shipping, working with partners, thinking about this, but we're not doing enough on this front. And so I think technology has a big role to play here and, and uh, I'm really excited uh, about this next chapter. Oh, brilliant, I think you set me up pretty well, thank you. By the way, this was not a pre-stage conversation, but so I just came off the road trip four weeks, right, I was in DC, then went on to the Asia. I spent about two weeks into India. Traceability and sustainability was more talked about, more so than even AI. So let me qualify that statement. There's about 387 regulations that are coming about globally, primarily driven by EU, right? And then followed by us, at home. These are not the regulation as an advisory that so please do this. These are consequential regulation that will force and mandate the traceability, meaning having a carbon footprint calculated at the unit level. I talked to the business leader over the last four weeks. I didn't see anyone is even prepared to have a conversation, far less to talk about being compliant. Right? Why do I talk about it? Because you look at it today in the space of traceability, only 6% of the publicly traded company will be compliant by 2027 regulatory requirement. Let's start with Mattel. Yeah, so we, we actually, in my weekly staff meeting, this, this came up uh, this morning, uh, and our, our quality leader, my counterparts leading a pretty big initiative on this for the EU, and, and my direct report talked about, you know, digital passport uh, this morning. Uh, and there is a lot of work ahead of us, but he's, he's, he's on it with his team, and we will be compliant to the, uh, to, to the, re to, to the regulations and specs. And, you know, that, that's one of the things about, again, back to purpose and culture, right? That's behind what, you know, part of what Mattel stands for, uh, also, ESG, we have a 2030 citizenships report, so I'm going to say we're not perfect, but we're going to do things that make sense in ESG. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that is around, you know, recyclable resins uh, that go in the, in the plastics into our toys that we're, we're thinking about and thinking about, obviously, the basic things, you know, a lot different in, in, in what we do in our... Uh, logistics and distribution network, you know, we, we, we had like five, you know, ESG initiatives to accomplish with about 15 actions. And, you know, every, every DC across the globe, all 38, got 12 out of the 15 nailed uh, in 2023, and we'll, we'll get the rest of them done this year. David, your vault fictive, I mean, do you think you guys will be compliant by 2027? Well, I think you have to be. And I think it's actually about in a supply chain, it's more of a supply web, is what I always like to say. It's not links that are all connected. And so it's less about fictive and more, how do you build a standard with your partners and your partner's partners? How do you go to where the raw material is sourced? How do you think about this? So to your traceability, we can have traceabilities within our companies. We can control these walls. You know, Mattel's talking about this digital passports, understanding where all that information comes from, what the practices are. This is work ahead of us. I would say there's not a, a clear roadmap on this, and this needs to be worked on, Nick. So, Mark, 
your approach from the semiconductor side of the Sony. Have you looked at this as a horizon scan or an opportunity, or you just kicked the can down? Oh, definitely. In, in, in our just small part of Sony, uh, the iTrius platform is really optimized to try to figure out how to not only lessen our impact on the environment based on power consumption, but also in things like logistics where we're trying to do better space utilization of trucking and consolid freight consolidation and optimization in those ways, because that reduces a lot of uh, and, and helps the environment overall in those types of efforts. So not only does our platform speak to that, but also the solutions that we're building with it also work towards that effort. So Maya, we have a lot of entrepreneurs here and startup folks in this panel, I mean, in the audience. Is this space excites the venture capitalist in a terms million, of investing? A million and 5%, and outside of the hard tech that's coming down the pipe, there's so much if you've got the data that you can harness that you can do now, right? So at Shopify, we had uh, carbon cost for all shipments uh, published and offset for stuff that Shopify merchants would send, right? I can go on United Airlines right now and buy an airline, airline ticket and understand how much carbon I'm burning for that, that uh, trip. So I think so much can be done today. We're invested in a company that's helping EV fleets optimize when they charge the, the fleets um, uh, based on the time of day and the cost per kilowatt that they're buying. So there's a lot we can do today with the data to, to impact our planet in addition to the, um, the scaling of the hard tech coming down the pipe. So, so yes, lots of meaningful opportunities here, really on the data and the hard tech side. So Maya, tell us, we're gonna start with you. Define the vision of supply chain. 2030, where we will we be? One sentence. Where do you see us in 2030, Maya? Wow, um, lots of agents optimizing your supply chain real time with optional human decision making at core inflection points. Excellent. Greg? Yeah, I'm gonna say an integrated end-to-end -end supply chain with increasing uh, direct-to-consumer. Very good. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think having the um, core elements of a continual data flow between the start of the supply chain and the end and being able to capture it and do something. I do have to say Maya's comment about the um, a generative. The, the way humans will interact with that data and the way application developers will develop over time, I think will change radically. I think it'll be more user-centric requests and and of pulling the appropriate data to start those activities to make it more efficient. Very good. Dave, one sentence, 2030 Outlook. I'll give context in one sentence. Uh, we started Fictive with this vision of how do you unlock the creative potential of all humans all over the world. And so when I think about 2030, I hope that in supply chains, each individual feels they're doing creative work that is inspiring and changing the world around them versus mundane road tasks that they have to do today. All right, so here, here's my take in 2030, truly. I think the harnessing the future of technology is incredible. I think to Dave's point, if we do not really focus on human capital at the same time, the devastation we saw in this country when the outsourcing happened, leaving tens and thousands of and millions hardworking men and women on the Rust Belt with absolutely no skill, Folks, the AI and some of the emerging technology we talked about it, if we don't pay attention to that, the human capital devastation we can live on this planet would be significant. So I think we need to embrace the technology, but also keep our species, human species in mind. And hopefully the regulators, industry leaders, you as a consumer and I and academia, we all work together to solve the future. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, my panelists. Thanks so much. Well done. Well done.